as many of you know who have followed me for years either on my website or on my YouTube channel. You know that I try to stay away from anything sensationalist and try to rely on good solid Bible prophecy along with good solid military and foreign policy intelligence. But today, but today as I was reading one of the articles that Foreign Policy Magazine put out on its website and this is a very solid source if you plan on uh, purchasing a source of foreign policy intelligence. I have used this source for many, many years and they have been spot on for, for the vast majority of things that they have uh, forecasted or have been uh, given an analysis for. That along with Stratford or The Economist or some, some of the others. You're going to get some good, solid intelligence from these particular news sources. You know, as I've always said, you need to, to look at the, the news sources that are solid in order to get the truth. Many of the news sources that you're going to get on the internet for free, such as what you might hear on Fox or CNN or whatever the case may be, even though Fox is a very good channel, they still are looking for viewers. So they get a little sensationalist on their own sometimes. And of course, CNN is one of the most liberal out there. So that's another source I probably would avoid. But again, they are a news source. But these other sources are paid sources that uh, I have found to be very reliable and to give very good forecasts over the years. And the article coming out of uh, Foreign Policy is, it's, is entitled, From Evil Genius to Ballroom Brawler. There's increasing evidence that Vladimir Putin is dangerously drunk on power and reckless. And from what I can tell, this is a free uh, article that you can go to Foreign Policy Magazine. I'll put the link uh, in, either on the computer and also, or I'm sorry, on the screen and also uh, at the uh, About description. But to give you a synopsis of what the article is talking about, basically starts out talking about how Vladimir Putin has gone back to his Soviet roots as a KBG agent and how he may very well be looking at his persona as being a genius or possibly a leader who believes he can stand up to the West and live to tell about it. In fact, there are rumors that some of his high officials, those who he used to count on for advice in the uh, uh, latter years, are no longer uh, giving advice but have been put in the outer core of his inner circle. Picking up with the article, it says, Of course, all leaders make decisions based on both rational calculation and emotional response, but in this case, Putin's unexpected bifurcation matters more for a number of reasons. The first of which is because of the very lack of checks and balances. Putin's regime was never as unreservedly autocratic as it often uh, seemed. Putin was first among equals, deriving much of his power precisely from his, uh, from his ability to manage, balance, and build coalitions within a variety of fragmented elite. Since his return to the presidency in 2012, he has become increasingly isolated apparent to, apparently by his own design. Bit by bit, this is eroding his position. But given that the controls on him were political rather than institutional, it leaves him virtually unconstrained at the moment. Figures such as Alexei Kudrin, the former finance minister and political technologist Vyacheslav Serko, who once uh, could tell him tough truths, fell from grace. The nationalists, bigots, and ex-spooks, often one and the same, uh, who were always a part of his court, now seem to dominate it. People who understand the wider world end up relegated to simply executing the orders from the Kremlin. Here in Moscow, for example, sources in the foreign ministry and the military make little secret that they were neither involved in the deliberations about uh, Crimea nor have any real sense of where the Kremlin is taking them. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who, as wily and experienced an, an operator as you'll find, apparently was not part of the inner circle that decided to invade Crimea. Instead, he had to mouth unbelievable lies, saying no troops were there. Even as video footage showed units in their Russian battle dress and Russian weapons spilling out of Russian armored vehicles with Russian license plates. The word from the uh, general staff, after all, is that no one in the Kremlin is asking their opinion. They are just there to make sure that whenever the velocity, the powers that be, tell them what needs to be done, they get it done. One, young, one just retired uh, officer, a high-flying young lieutenant in 1979 when Soviet forces rolled in Afghanistan over the misgivings of the general staff, glumly told me how from similar things uh, seem today. 
Well, this is probably what I wanted to uh, tell you about, and that is that, but while all this unfolds, the West is unprepared to deal with this new Putin. It becomes harder to know which of the usual instruments of this diplomacy and uh, statecraft will be most useful or appropriate. Measures intended to appeal to a rational actor in the Kremlin, such as targeted sanctions and threats to support Kyiv, um, may actually only inflame the emotional Putin. Not only has Russia become accustomed to Putin's heart taking second place to his head, so have we. Meaning he usually ta makes a rational decision, even though he may think in his heart that he doesn't want to. What is playing out in Crimea and potentially in eastern Ukraine is thus not just proof of Russian hegemonic ambition in post-Soviet Eurasia. It is also an expression of a genuine and serious change that is taking place at the core of Russian politics. It's something you should also know today. Russian forces uh, went outside of the border of Crimea and crossed the border into Ukraine and took over a natural gas plant in Ukraine. Now, whether or not this is uh, the first, sta uh, first stage or wave of a an invasion into Ukraine proper, I don't know, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. But Mr. Putin is, is getting bolder and bolder as to what he is going to do. And going on with the article, it says, Until now, Putin was a bare-knuckled and often confrontational geopolitical player, but even in invading uh, Georgia, he retained a clear sense of just how far he could go. Indeed, this was his genius to know what, uh, when to uh, play the game and when to break the rules. But Putin today is increasingly a character of, of Putin in his first two terms. He is listening to fewer dissident, dissenting voices, allowing less informed discussion of po policy options, deliberately narrowing his circle of counselors. Perhaps feeling the chill touch of political, if not physical, mortality, he appears not just unwilling but unable to uh, seem to be backing down from a fight, more concerned with short-term bravado than long-term implications. Is this a passing phase? Probably not. Put aside the old cliches about Putin the uh, chess player. We may have to get used to dealing with Putin the barroom brawler. And frankly, I think that's probably what's going to take place uh, as Bible prophecy progresses. As many of you know, at some point in time, Russia is going to be come, is going to come down upon Israel, as stated in, Reve in uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, in a war known as Gog and Magog. Now, Mr. Putin has already challenged the West one time when he invaded Georgia and was successful in backing the West down. Now he is taking even a bolder move against Ukraine. And given that the Bible says that one day Russia would lead an Islamic coalition down against Israel, I have to believe that if that is the case, then he will be successful in backing the West down one more time. And in doing so, he will pave the way to an even bolder move of com coming against uh, Israel in what the, like I said, what the battle describes as the Battle of Gog and Magog. Now, the placement of this battle, many have uh, questioned. Some believe it will take place before the uh, rapture of the church takes place. Some have stated that they believe this war will take place between the rapture and the start of the tribulation period. Others have said that it may very well be the catalyst that brings about the rapture. And when the Lord comes to take his uh, children from the earth in the rapture, he may come and do what is described in Ezekiel 38, where he brings catastrophe and plagues and fire and brimstone down upon the enemies of Israel. And the Bible says that uh, the whole world will see this as a deliverance from God himself. Now, one of the major glitches that seems to throw everybody off is that the Bible says in Ezekiel 39 that it will take seven years to burn the weapons. Now, personally, I am of the mind to, uh, to place this war somewhere just after the Antichrist brings about a major peace treaty. And I'll give it to you in a nutshell. And we all know that at the beginning of the tribulation period that it begins with a peace, a confirmation of a peace treaty with many. Now, what's been in the news lately with uh, Senator John Kerry, he's indicated that there's no place for the Israelis to declare that in order for there to be peace and a two-state solution that the Palestinians must recognize uh, Israel as a Jewish state. And he's indicated that that will not be a part of any peace accord. But what I think is going to happen is that I think this peace with many may very well be 
a monstrous peace accord in which it will include Syria, it will include Iran, and much of the Middle East, if not all of the Middle East. That will, if nothing else, give lip service to a uh, peace accord that will normalize relations with Israel and it will open up the trading uh, blocks uh, throughout the world. Now many are going to say that just is an, it seems to be an impossible thing. Well, you're right, it is an impossible thing with man, but this is, you got to remember, this peace accord is going to be blessed of God, meaning that it is, it is ordained by God to happen. Personally, I believe that it's, the Antichrist is probably going to rise up uh, and it will be picked by God. I know that many believe that Satan will choose him, and he very well may, but you know what, I, I don't necessarily lean that way, but I don't discount the other either. And the, and the reason why I don't lean that way is because when Jesus came the first time, he chose Judas, not Satan. Satan did not choose Judas. He finally possessed him at the very end. But from the beginning, Jesus knew exactly what his mission would be eventually, that he would betray him. And that's likely what will happen when the tribulation period starts, that God will choose the Antichrist. And at the midway point when Satan and his uh, demons are cast out of heaven, he will come down and possess the Antichrist, just as he did back when uh, he possessed uh, Judas. But enough about that. Once this peace accord is established, and it will seem to be a miraculous type of peace accord, the whole world will be saying peace and safety and longing for this day, and finally it has come. But when the second seal is, is opened, uh, peace will be taken from the earth, and I believe it will almost be immediately. And this is what I feel will probably take place. Now, again, this is theory. I place this Ezekiel 38 and 39 Gog and Magog war as the war that will break the peace and safety. Now, I'm not saying that it will break the seven-year peace accord, but I think this is when Mr. Putin or whoever it is in charge in, in Russia at this time will revolt against the power of the Antichrist and bring the Islamic world with him, thinking that he will have the same results he had both in uh, Georgia and in Ukraine, where the West will protest but will not intervene. They may again uh, try to threaten sanctions or whatever the case may be. And the Bible says that uh, one nation outside of the West will also protest, and that nation is Saudi Arabia. And as I've said, for those who uh, cling to a Psalm 83 war, that seems to be a little bit strange to me that Saudi Arabia, after losing their land in what many believe to be a previous Psalm 83 war now is protesting upon the heels of Russia coming down and taking their spoil. But I won't go into that because I've, I have uh, covered that in other videos. You may want to take a, look, take a listen to that. But once this battle begins to commence and uh, Russia starts to gather its troops on the southwestern border of Syria, now you have to remember Russia already, already has a number of bases already in Syria. So that's probably where their stopping off point and uh, the beginning of their battle plan will, will be commenced. And the Bible does say that this great army will commence on the northern part, uh, northern part of the mountains of Israel. Now I don't think that Egypt, Jordan, or uh, Saudi Arabia will take part in this war, and that's one reason they are at this time allies of the U.S. And as we know already, Saudi Arabia is already one of the mentioned countries who will protest this war. And I, I'm not going to go into why I believe all the reasons why they won't get involved, but the, there, are, there are other reasons as well. Now, whether Syria will get involved, uh, that's unknown. Frankly, I don't think they will to, to a, a, a large extent because I think this is pretty much going to be left to the nations who are listed. And there may be some outside of that list because it does say, and the uh, hordes that come with them. So we really don't know all, to what extent all the nations will be, that will be involved. But when they begin to multiply and to amass on the northern border, all will look as if it was lost for Israel. This is not just an Islamic army that they defeated many, many times in the past. Now it includes a very powerful nuclear power uh, in Russia. But before the battle can commence, God takes control, as we know from Scripture, and he brings down plagues and fire and he destroys uh, five sixths of the army that is uh, encamped about uh, in the northern hills of Israel and destroys them before they can even begin the battle. Now, when the Bible says in uh, Revelation chapter 6, I believe it's verse 2 or 3, it says that a great war then proceeds. And from this great world war, 
One quarter of the world's population is destroyed. It would not shock me that when this great battle begins and, and, and the uh, awesome deliverance, miraculous deliverance that God brings, that the West doesn't and the forces behind the Antichrist don't uh, retaliate against Russia and other nations with a great nuclear barrage, not only against Russia, but against other nations. And I think Israel would probably do the same thing because the Bible says that, like I said, Probably about 2 billion people are going to die in this war, so I would assume it's going to be a nuclear war. So I look for on the heels of this uh, Russian invasion to, to cause a great nuclear war. And I have to believe that Israel's finger is going to be on their nuclear warheads. And that if there was ever a time where I believe that a Psalm 83 war scenario would take place, it would be right now. Because we know that the whole world is going to be wrapped up in a monstrous world war. I'd have to believe that Israel's neighbors would probably attack Israel at this time. Now, which neighbors? I don't know. But it should also be noted at the same time that at the Battle of Armageddon, Israel will be surrounded and the whole world will come against Israel at this war. So this is another time in which that, uh, some, well, some type of Psalm 83 war scenario could take place. But the bottom line is, is that once this war begins, I believe uh, the Bible does say that one quarter of the world's population will be destroyed. It is estimated that 50 million plus people died worldwide during World War II, the greatest war we've ever known. The Bible says that one quarter of the world's population will say that there'll be an 8 billion population on earth at this time. That would mean 2 billion people would die. If we go with a war uh, death toll of, uh, for World War II of 50 million, that means that 40 times that of World War II will perish during this war. This is an unfathomable loss of life that the world simply won't even be able to comprehend. And it very well could be kicked off by Mr. Putin and his lust for worldwide wealth and power. Now certainly I don't know what's going through Mr. Putin's head. And I very well may be overplaying this whole scenario. But the Bible is clear that two things are absolutely going to happen. A Russian-led Islamic confederation is coming down upon Israel to take a spoil. And there will be, at the breaking of the second seal, a war that will take place that will take the lives of one quarter of the world's population. Now whether or not this will be the scenario that will ultimately take place in order for this to happen is unknown. But as we look and see Bible prophecy being played out in a, the world of foreign policy, we certainly can't discount the fact that this could very well take place. Now, of course, there still is the question of the seven years to burn the weapons. Personally, I don't discount the fact that those weapons will be burned throughout the seven years of the tribulation period. Now, of course, we know that a remnant of Israelis will uh, flee to Petra about the midway point, but not everybody will. And, of course, there will always be somebody who will be occupying the land in which Israel uh, has been promised, whether it be Jews or Gentiles. But either way, this has always been a simple sticking point as to the placement of this battle. And I'm sure many of you have your own theories, your own scenarios that you believe will take place. But one thing's for sure, it is coming, and maybe sooner than we all think. And certainly I don't expect everyone who hears this video to accept my theory at face value. So if you have an alternate, alternate viewpoint that you want to express, uh, be sure and put it in the comments. I'd love to read what you, you might have to say. Maybe it'll change my theory. And as always, I always like to leave with a message of salvation. If you don't know the Lord as Savior, your time is running out. You know, 150,000 people will die today. And let's forget about talking about the tribulation period or the rapture right now. 150,000 people will die today. And the vast majority will end up in a burning hell. And you know the real problem of that is, is that all of them will have had their sins paid for. You know Jesus died that we might have our sins paid for. But unless you accept him as savior of your life. Turn your life over to him and believe that he died for your sins. And believe he is the savior of the world. You're going to die in your sins. Don't let that happen to you. Well, this is Terry Malone with the Calvary Prophecy Report.